that we have given general anesthesia, still why, why, what is the need for giving regional anesthesia? Because administration of regional block offers preemptive analgesia preventing central sensitization. You will be asked what is preemptive analgesia? That is analgesia that is provided before even surgical incision occurs. So you give analgesia first and then the surgeon operates. This way there is, uh, you know, this can prevent the central sensitization and it reduces the intraoperative anesthetic requirement, maintains a better hemodynamic stability and it provides extended period of the postoperative analgesia. Thus, you can achieve opioid sparing by giving preemptive analgesia. So, why regional anesthesia with GA? That is, uh, in what way we are giving? This is, you are giving brachial block as preemptive analgesia. Any contraindication for brachial block? These will be usually the same that are uh, contraindication that you will give, uh, you know, you will know for any regional anesthetic. Patient refusal, absolute contraindication. Infection at the site, coagulopathy, known allergy to local anesthetics and inability of the patient to cooperate. No, sometimes then you will have to refuse. This is short note asked in the exam, theoretical exam also and even in practical exam, the examiner will ask you, sometimes the examiner will ask you to draw the uh, brachial plexus also and therefore this part you must know very well. Now brachial plexus if you see, it is formed by the central rami, ventral rami of the C5 to T1 roots with occasional input from C4 as well as T2. Now these are the, these come out from the spinal foramina and then they unite to form three trunks. So these are the trunks. So central uh, ventral rami of C5, C6 form the superior trunk, C7 continues as middle trunk and C8 and T1 unite to form the inferior trunk. Immediately after forming the trunk, each trunk divides into anterior and posterior branch. Okay, so there will be six divisions, three anterior divisions, three posterior divisions. Now they will again reunite to form cords. The anterior division of first and the second, they will form the lateral cord. All the posterior divisions of all the three trunks, they will form the posterior cord. So this is lateral cord, this is posterior cord and the anterior division of the inferior trunk will be a continuous medial cord. So now we have, we had five roots, three trunks, six divisions and three cords. Now each of these cords will give rise to individual uh, nerves. And therefore to know the root value of the nerves, you will have to trace back the nerve. For example, if you take a single nerve as a musculoskeletal uh, cutaneous nerve, then the, its root value is C5 and C6. You can see it here. It is uh, uh, achieving, uh, receiving the input from all these three roots. Now this is same picture, but it is superimposed on the surrounding um, structures, anatomical structures. So the roots come in between the anterior scalene. This is anterior scalene. This is uh, middle scalene. In between the roots will come. These are the ventral rami. So five roots. The trunks will be formed after they leave the middle scalene muscle and that is where you give the your interscalene block. We will come see that in the next slide. And then after the, the clavicle and between the first rib, the entire brachial plexus will uh, go and it will be the divisions will be behind the clavicle. As you can see, this is the clavicle and the divisions are behind the clavicle and the cords will be uh, immediately after the brachial plexus leaves the clavicle and then as it reaches or approaches the axilla, you will see the individual nerves. So if you see, now I have superimposed this picture on the another uh, uh, picture. So these are again roots, these are the interscalene uh, block, it will cover these three trunks. So it will block these three trunks. Then supraclavicular uh, block, it will form, it will uh, involve the divisions, so three anterior and three divisions. Supraclavicular block is at the level of divisions. Then infraclavicular block will be at the level of cords and axillary block will be at the level of individual nodes. 
this is very important when you decide which block to be give, uh, which approach to choose so whenever you are using interscaling block it is it blocks the upper and middle trunks so you, it is useful for shoulder and upper arm surgery the here you can see supraclavicular block it is uh, it blocks the distal trunks and the proximal divisions and it's useful for uh, surgery on the arms and the elbow infraclavicular block it blocks the cords and it is useful for elbow and forearm surgery and axillary block will be at the layer for distal forearm wrist and hand surgery you can see it here again it will be clearer here the same thing i have uh, you know so sort of tabulated now our patient has distal radius fracture so for our patient the forearm uh, uh, surgery infraclavicular as well as axillary block will be the block of choice which one we will choose i would choose axillary why axillary this is what you are uh, asked in exam why you want to choose the axillary over infraclavicular block that is because you must know what are the advantages of axillary block in axillary block the plexus is situated very superficially within 1 to 3 cm from skin whenever there is superficial block it is easy to administer as well as easy, it is very easy to deal with the complication so that answer you have to give technically it is very easy it is the desired nerve block for the proposed surgery that is in the distal forearm and at the wrist level minimum possibility of complications then here you will be asked about the complications of other blocks also for example problems with uh, interscalene block are there can be injury to the vertebral artery spinal cord phrenic nerve block etc patient can develop horner syndrome if it is supraclavicular approach then you can have pneumothorax the incidence of pneumothorax is quite high in case of supraclavicular approach there can be injury to the subclavian artery also where in uh, axillary block also there is a possibility of vascular puncture but it is very uh, being superficial it can be easily compressed next question that is often asked is what are the nerves that are blocked by axillary block and that is why you have to know this is the these are the nerves which carried for in the axillary sheath this is the axillary sheath so this is the conjoint tendon this is the axillary artery which is single artery usually there will be multiple veins and then there are this is median nerve which is situated anteriorly and laterally the ulnar nerve which is situated anteriorly and medially and radial nerve which is situated posterior to the artery and this is how they travel together and this musculoskeletal musculocutaneous nerve is it is not in the axillary uh, sheath but it is separately it lies uh, it is given off early and lies outside the axillary sheath in the coracobrachialis muscle so this you will need to uh, infiltrate separately whereas in the axillary sheath if you give your injection usually it will be able to take care of or block other three nerves and then you will be asked to demonstrate on yourself or on the patient the nerve supply of the upper extremity with their dermatomal values so please get these things from your textbook very clearly now a sensory blockade of the brachial plexus block by axillary approach the analgesia will be from mid arm if you see mid arm distally here you can see the musculocutaneous nerve needs to be blocked separately so this is little problem with this block the tunica pain may not be tolerated by this uh, block and therefore skin over the see this skin is spared so this skin you need to inject infiltrate device you are giving the block so it is infiltrated with local anesthetic solution to block the intercostal brachialis nerve